All right, so before I bring you into this courtroom where John Skipper will be taking the witness stand and discussing the very secret business behind the 2018 and 2022 World Cups, we first need to go back almost about 20 years ago, all the way back to 2005, actually, when John Skipper was ESPN's executive vice president of content. Because this was the year when John personally attempted to start doing business with the infamous president of FIFA, a man named Sepp Blatter. In 2005, I uh, had the great privilege of being put in charge of the production and programming of all the ESPN media. Um, one of the first things I said I wanted to do was to acquire the World Cup rights. The World Cup rights had never been purchased by ESPN. FIFA decided, oh, we're going to sell the rights in 2010 and 2014, and it's time for somebody in the United States to pay for them. At some point, a predecessor of mine at ESPN had decided, we're not going to bid. Not It's not worth having. Mm. Uh, I believed it was the most popular sport in the world. I believed it belonged on ESPN in the United States, that ESPN could grow it the best. Uh, and I asked George Bodenheimer, who was the president, permission to fly to Switzerland because Dick Ebersol, this is, I did not, nobody called and told me this, but I do believe it to be the case that Dick Ebersol had shaken hands with Sepp Blatter. This is Dick Ebersol, the legendary head of NBC Sports. The legendary head of NBC Sports, who apparently believed that shaking Sepp Blatter's hand actually had some meaning <laughs> other than your chance to get a little bit of sort of Swiss perspiration on you. Yeah. Sepp returned to his executive committee and said, good news, we're going to get paid for um, the uh, World Cup rights in 10 and 14. Uh, NBC would like to do a deal with us. I don't know what it was for. The opportunity that I had was that Major League Soccer had always tied its rights deals to the rights deals to get the U.S., rights to the World Cup. So mm. it was the World Cup holder, rights holder, must also do an MLS deal. And Dick Eversall was not interested in doing an MLS deal. At ESPN, we were a rights holder for Major League Soccer. I believed in that. I believed in what Don Garber was doing. So I conspired. I had dinner with Don Garber at the Shunley Palace. The commissioner of MLS. Commissioner of MLS. In Shunley Palace, an institution in New York. On the, the original one, on the Upper West Upper Side. Upper West Side, that's right. I think if I got the job on something like October 10th, October 11th or 12th, I was conspiring with Don Garber in Shunley Palace for how I was going to get George Bodenheimer's permission uh, Bob Iger's permission to fly to Zurich, uh, go to their headquarters, which were in Zug, Z-U-G at the time, and try to undo the NBC handshake with Sepp Blatter. Mm. The co other co-conspirator in this is a colorful character named Chuck Blazer. Oh, man. Very odd guy. He looked like Zeus. He <laughs> probably weighed 320 pounds. When you met with Chuck, you went to some fancy private club that he belonged to. He had a condominium in the same building. He had parrots in cages. I, Those I, parrots would sit on his shoulder <laughs> when you were having meetings with him. This is the same man I had read who had an apartment, or rather, excuse me, he did not have an apartment alone at Trump Tower. His cats had an apartment at Trump Tower. And I believe I was in that apartment with Chuck. Don Garber introduced me to him. He was the head of CONCACAF, so the, the federation that manages the soccer in the United States, Mexico, Canada, and the Caribbean. But Sepp Blatter, I believe by the governance, such as it is of FIFA, had to confer with the regional head of whatever 
region there was on the selling of those rights. So Chuck Blazer, who was not a retiring, shy kind of guy, apparently was the one guy willing to uh, look at Sepp Blatter and go, no, you cannot sell those rights to NBC without the recommendation of the local head of CONCAF and a vote of the executive committee. So Don, Chuck, and I knew that we had the opportunity to break this deal up. I flew to Zug. I met with um, Nicholas Erickson, who was in charge of selling the media rights. I believe I convinced them fairly quickly that ESPN was a better home for those rights. And this is the director of TV, Nicholas Erickson, at yes. the time for FIFA. Yes. Um, FIFA wanted to have the Women's World Cup on the same place. Um, MLS wanted to have an MLS deal with whoever the World Cup uh, holders were. They also wanted you to do the under-21 tournament, the under-17 tournament, all the qualifiers. We had ESPN. We had 7, 8, 9, 10. I don't have any networks. Yep. We said we'll put them all on. That was our great advantage. And I am pretty sure that I asked Nicholas Erickson what it would take for us to win the bid, probably had some advice from Chuck as well. That number was $100 million. And um, it was a little like the sort of Austin Powers thing, right? It was $100 million. <laughs> $100 billion. <laughs> Gentlemen, silence. And you could have the rights for the World Cup in 2010 in South Africa and 2014 in Brazil. Uh, we paid $100 million, 40 for South Africa, and 60 for Brazil. Mm. I do not know if we bid the most money. I never know, knew what uh, NBC had bid, and, but we won. And ESPN kept winning because it was airing the 2010 World Cup out of South Africa, airing those games across ABC and Univision as well, and all sorts of records immediately got broken. More than 24 million Americans watched Spain beat the Netherlands in the final, the largest audience for a soccer game in American history. The World Cup overall was the most viewed World Cup ever on English language television. And so it was pretty good timing, John thought, that the very next year, this is 2011 now, bidding for the fateful 2018 and 2022 World Cups would begin. Nobody has produced a better World Cup than we did in 10 and 14. Those two World Cups clearly put the event on the map in the United States. The ratings skyrocketed. We did all the games. The world began to understand why this is the most interesting quadrennial sporting event in the world. So I certainly expected to walk in and be able to renew those rights. I had more marketing resources than any other company. We had plenty of channels to put these on. We had done it twice. Uh, we had good relationships with Jerome Valk and Nicholas Erickson. This is the Secretary General of FIFA, Jerome Valk, at the yes. time. Yes. I never spent much time with uh, uh, Mr. Blatter. Um, he's a little... You know, Mr. Blatter, you, you had to be really important. I was once in a suite with Seth Blatter and Bill Clinton. and Oh, wow. And uh, they both were about to leave, and the security patrols for the two entities began to have a slight disagreement about who got to leave first <laughs> and take precedence. Uh, uh, President Clinton won. Because he actually is in charge of an important country, <laughs> uh, Sepp Blatter, and it's one of the characteristics that you feel when you spend time with FIFA. They think they're an independent uh, geographical entity. Mm. I don't know if they think they're a country, a nation state, a of nation sorts. state. They do think they're a nation state of sort. I had an agreement. Um, which you can have. And by the way, I could have not lived up to my part of the agreement. They certainly did not live up to theirs. And that agreement is, if you will let me know what the high bid is, I will top it. Um, and I'm the best broadcaster to do this. Our ESPN is the best broadcaster to do that. So we're going to get a deal, right? Yes, we are. We're going to get a deal. 
uh, and I was told that, and uh, we were bidding with Univision with Sandy Brown, and he was also present when told, yes, you're going to get an opportunity, assuming you're prepared to pay the most money to renew your deal, uh, and uh, we'll live happily ever after. You're the incumbents. I'm the, we're the incumbents. We arrive at a lunch on the day the bids are to be put in, only to be told by, by the way, Jerome Valk didn't even have the courage to look me in the face and tell me. I said, Jerome, I'm just making sure that the deal that you and I agreed on is still in effect. And Jerome looked at Nicholas Erickson and said, Nicholas, please, please tell John what, what we're going to have to do here. Mm. He did not, would not even say it himself. He had poor Nicholas Erickson, uh, his understudy, who had to say to me, John, we have had so much scrutiny uh, that we have to play this by the book. Meaning that the verbal agreement, that understanding that you guys had had, it was going to be superseded by the most straightforward by the book proceeding because of the scrutiny. Just going to open the envelopes and whoever has the high bid. We raised our bid. Uh, we did not raise it enough. I do not know if we had the high bid. I don't think we did. But we certainly were prepared to. Uh, and they chose not to take the high bid because in a moment of conscience, which might be a singular event in the history <laughs> of this organization, they decided we're going to have to play this one by the book. But just to be clear, extra clear here, what you went into this negotiation saying, as you had previously, and we've talked about this before on the show, um, you wanted to pay the most. I you, wanted to win. You wanted to I, win I, this. I, I, whatever it was, plus one is what you were willing to pay. Yes. And so... What you were uh, noticing quite inevitably was that you didn't get a chance to up your bid again. Uh, we did not. Now, I want to say there was a second round of bidding. We could have bid three times as much as the other person. I don't know what the other person bid, so I could not have calculated it. But theoretically, uh, would they have awarded it to us? I'll never know. What I know is... They wanted to award it to Fox. So as the person who was controlling the purse strings on behalf of ESPN for how much you wanted to put in, and this was your passion project, right? what was your emotional reaction to learning that you were now shut out of the bid and you would not get the World Cup? I was uh, disappointed, but I was also angry. We didn't lose many bids at ESPN. When we did, I was always disappointed. This is the only time I ever felt like, it's funny, I was not outfoxed here uh, in the sense that you would use little f. <laughs> I was outfoxed with a big F. Yeah, and, I, and by the way, big F to them too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so I was angry. Do you remember now how you heard or where you were when you heard yeah, I remember exactly. I was asleep, uh, and I'd only been asleep, I think, about an hour um, because um, I was with Scott Guglielmino. Oddly enough, we ran into Eric Shanks, who's a good guy. He was uh, uh, one of the heads of Fox Sports. Yep, uh, that night uh, at a bar. Um, I don't. I have no idea what he knew. If he knew what was going to happen, he didn't betray it. We had friendly uh, conversation. We, we sort of chortled as we left going, yeah, we, we got this because we thought with the new bid, we had the high bid. We thought we were going to win. Scott Guglielmino called me. Uh, I was in a bit of a haze. That's most I'll say about it. We'd been out quite late. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was shocked. And it took me quite a while to get anyone to be willing to talk to me. Jerome Valk, um avoided me. Nicholas Erickson avoided me. They didn't have much to say. I do remember crossing the Triber Bridge because while I had been flying home from Switzerland, Jerome Valk had called, and I do recall raising my voice to him and expressing my displeasure as I'm crossing over the Triber Bridge to go back into Manhattan. He he had nothing to say. I guess I give him credit for actually getting on the phone with me, uh, but I doubt he ever wanted to talk to me again, and I never wanted to talk to him again, and never did. If I never see him again, I'll be 
it will be one of the things that goes into a positive column. Yes, the Triborough Bridge, um, in this case, ferrying you across a Rubicon. Uh, it was taking me across uh, the East Rubicon, and, uh, you know, at that point, I knew we weren't going to have the World Cup. See, it's the greatest disappointment uh, in a rights deal. And, of course, the disappointment is because I love the sport. I love what we did with it. But it's also because, you know, I'd like to compete on a fair playing field. Look, we knew we were dealing with a corrupt organization. FIFA is a corrupt organization. FIFA regards themselves almost as outside the law. Right. I do think they're arrogant. It's not clear what your what jurisdiction they happen to exist in. But they transcend borders and they sell people the thing that people across the planet want the most. Uh, yes. And I do remember when um, FIFA announced, I think at some point they had somewhere north of $1 billion, slightly south of $2 billion in the bank. That is a hellaciously excellent financial position for what I believe is a nonprofit. And... And, um, but by the way, uh, just doing my research here, approximately 70% of its uh, $5.7 in total revenues between 2011 and 2014 was because of the sale of TV and marketing rights, in this case, just specific to the 2014 World Cup, yes. just as a matter of example as to how much the TV rights are the business of they, this nonprofit. They are worth a lot of money. Also, I never, uh, I remember uh, at some point Jerome Vault complaining that uh, because of all his legal issues, he was going to, I think, have to sell his yacht. Uh, and it's a really interesting nonprofit where there are executive members who are able to buy a yacht, travel privately, have multiple homes uh, at a nonprofit. Uh, why this is a nonprofit, I don't know. Wait, you expect you expect FIFA executives to go yachtless, John? You, yeah, no, you, you I know. barbarian? I know. I know, given what they're doing for the world, <laughs> and they're just trying to protect the world's greatest game. But somehow, they managed to live very well. <laughs> <laughs> 